so great to see so many people already this morning. A little earlier on the West Coast, we wanted to uh, take advantage of a little bit more light, even though it is uh, quite gloomy. <laughs> quite uh, overcast there in Paris today, but it's still beautiful, right? Sometimes the gloomy skies help outline the buildings a little bit. So we always have to take, take what we could get. And we have Kate is back, back in Paris. And we'll give everybody a few minutes to get in here. Back on my... Uh, Laptop command central. I just also I came. We Kate and I just missed each other when I was uh, leaving. She was coming. Hi, Karen. Hi, Karen. So it's great to see so many people this morning. Yes, and Catherine says it's gloomy and cold. That when I got, I've been back every day in Portland. I think. The other day, yesterday was the first day that I saw sunshine. It it has looked even gloomier than this uh, for the last uh, few days since I got back and I was just really not having it. <laughs> so for everybody, if you are new on here, you want to make sure that you find uh, Kate's feed. So it'll say Kate French. And if you're on an iPad or a iPhone, you could just double click her image. She's showing the Seine right now with the Orsay on the right and the Louvre on the left. So couldn't get much better than that. And if you are just on a computer or something else um, in the top right of her little uh, picture, click the blue, uh, blue dot and um, do pin to screen. So then that way you see her image and you still see me. And I will turn mine off for now, just so that if you get back to my yapping without a picture, <laughs> you know to go find Kate, hopefully. I tried to see if there's a way to even ch like change it instead of my name and have it just say, go find Kate French. <laughs> but it never seems to, uh, I, I haven't been able to figure that out. So we've got some people still popping in here a little bit. So we will just, I'll go ahead and get started here though, um, because we are on um, this wonderful bridge. This is the uh, Passerelle Leopold uh, Senghor, and he was a um, Senegalese poet and statesman, and he was a huge Francophile, including being in charge of a lot of the Francophile organizations. Um, and so on the 100th anniversary of his death, they renamed it um, for him in 2006 or 100th anniversary of his birth, I should say. Um, and But before that, it was a bridge built by Napoleon III and it actually carried cars. Now, because it's a passerelle, it is just a footbridge, which the Pont des Arts is technically a passerelle because it's just walking, but that one's called Pont des Arts. So, you know, it's always, we always have to keep us guessing and figuring things out. There's no, it's just like the French language. There's no rule, <laughs> but it's a really great bridge. It's really cool. And Kate kind of is standing right over it. Um, the way that the bridge goes is it, it it's, I think one of the only bridges that you could reach the lower uh, K and the top on the same bridge. And so it has these really cool steps that go all the way down on both sides of it. So if you're walking along um, the lower part, walking along the Seine, you can walk up here, but it's really cool because the, uh, the steps get, smaller and smaller as far as their depth and then it just turns into this flat surface so it's kind of cool to be able to walk down there when they first put the uh, when they first did this the original bridge was 1861 100 years later in 1961 they replaced it that's when they made it just the footbridge and it was a metal frame and the wood on it was this special African wood, but it was incredibly slippery. So people, it got, uh, you know, whenever it'd get rainy or it was frosty, people were constantly falling. So they ended up having to put some treads on there. So if you walking on it, there are these little strips of, uh, you know, just uh, almost like sandpaper that gives you a little bit of traction. The Pont des Arts, when the Pont des Arts does get frosty in the morning, um, it does get pretty slick, but if you walk next to the uh, edges of the bridge, it seems to stay 
um, a little less slippery, but you know, it's wood and it's just open. You can see the sen right below you between the slats. And so it gets a little, gets a little slippery. But this uh, bridge, of course, it leads us on the right bank is the Jardin de Tuileries. And then over here on the left bank, it takes us towards the Musée d'Orsay, which is where we're going to walk around today. And you have this little great area down there. There's always people working out. There's like some little gyms down there. Um, there's always people doing like, I think there's boxing down there right now. And then it's a lot of times they keep, they do this project in the summer where they paint a lot of these. Um, and so they have these like very elaborate murals that go on for quite a ways. You could kind of see the remains of some of it, uh, but it's always fun to walk down there. And then on this side, of course, we look towards the Grand Palais. And Kate's staying nice and toasty and warm today, hopefully with all of her la layers. So there's lots of people out, even though it's chilly. Hopefully the, we'll have to, uh, on the way back on the other side, uh, we'll, we'll check the level of the sun because it was getting kind of high. But right here, this guy, you might all know him. All of us Americans might know this guy right here. It's Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson is standing right here. Um, it was done by uh, Jean Cardo, and he did this in 2006. He also did the statue of, oh, that would look like me on rollerblades. Um, he also did the statue of uh, Winston Churchill and also of Charles de Gaulle that's over by the um, Petit Palais and the Grand Palais. But he did this one, it was installed in 2006. But right there on this little tablet gives you a little hint of exactly why he is here. So on this is uh, if you've ever did the high school trip um, way back when, I doubt they do that anymore, um, where you go to Washington DC and you go visit all these historic places and you got to go to Monticello or maybe did that later in life. Um, Monticello, he, Thomas Jefferson um, was famous for being, you know, one of the uh, Americans that fell in love with Paris. And uh, he was there as the ambassador for a while. And he absolutely loved it. He loved the everything about Paris, especially the wine. And he fell in love with this building that we that he is looking at. And the building that he is looking at inspired Monticello. So if you've ever seen Monticello or you are on your computer and you look up a picture of Monticello, um, it was, you definitely see that. And that is why he um, has that on that piece of paper he's holding, which is really, really pretty cool. Um, it is, this is the Hotel de Sam, and we'll go down the side street um, when you go across Kate. And this is, you can really see from here, but this not only did this building inspire Monticello, but it also inspired another very famous building in America, which we'll see from um, the opposite side of the street once we get around the corner. Um, but it's really a cool building. It now holds the uh, the Museum of the Légion d'Honneur, uh, which is a really cool museum to go see that has very awkward hours. So it makes it rather difficult to get to go see it, but it's definitely worth a visit. Um, I went, probably five years ago and I have yet to go back in there even though I'm at the Orsay all the time but they open in the afternoon and usually I get in and out of the Orsay um, after the crowds get bad so I'm usually not right there but every time I'm like I gotta go back I gotta go back it's it's really cool I'll tell you more about it but it was built in 1781 before that if you listen to our episode we did um, about the Musée d'Orsay um, it was this whole area belonged in a, the 1600s, Margaret de Valois, who was the first wife of Henry um, the fourth. She had this um, area and this was kind of where her garden was. And then over time in the seventh, in the 18th century, a lot of this started being built up after she basically, they got rid of her um, property. So the um, Frederick III of Salm Cribor, he ended up um, having a nearby property and it was just, he thought it was just too small. So he needed something bigger. So he had this building created. It was done by the architect Pierre Rousseau, um, who ended up living here for a short period of time because 
Frederick III got in some trouble during the revolution, aligning himself with the wrong people and met the guillotine. <laughs> so later on, Pierre Rousseau had stayed there. Um, it ended up being that um, Frederick III, his heirs ended up getting it back, um, but later on that ended up coming back to the state. But Frederick's sister was involved with Alexander uh, de Beauharnais, who was the husband of Josephine, the future wife of Napoleon, and he was just a real cad, but his sister was Alexander's uh, lover, and then... Alexander met the same fate as Frederick on the same day of the guillotine. So it was a farewell, Alexander. But Josephine almost went to the guillotine too. Luckily, everything, Robespierre was out of power and then he ended up, she ended up getting released. Um, but she almost died of the guillotine too. Oh, look at Kate, you're so good. I love those. So these, these are the historic plaques that you see all over Paris. These are the official ones, the Histoire du Paris. These are the stark uh, oars um, because of Paris and its whole tie back to, uh, see Pierre Rousseau, um, it's tie back to the logo with the, with the ship um, these ones are the ones of the plaques in Paris, you will find these ones are always accurate. The ones that are on buildings sometimes aren't, don't take those as a, as gospel, <laughs> but these ones are great. And so every time I see those, I always have to stop and take 15 photos of them. And I keep thinking I'll have like a big catalog of all of them. And then I come back and have 40,000 photos and, and then I get through the first three days and, and then it's time to leave again. <laughs> But so this building is amazing. Um, on this side of it, if you look, if we peek through these slats here, that colonnade in the back also inspired a little bit of the White House. <clears throat> so this building really inspired a lot of uh, very uh, prominent buildings in the United States. So this is where the Légion d'honneur um, was created under Napoleon, and it is um, the highest highest medal or anything that could be stowed on a French person, um, which is they could be stowed with the highest level, with this, which is the chancellor. The other people, you can be American, you could be English from other countries, and you could also get um, a Légion d'honneur. They have all different ones. They have ones for, you know, gifts to the, to the country, um, for their talents to, that were, you know, imparted on France. So there's quite a few people um, that have been given them over time and the medals are really really cool and so when you go to the museum you get to see all of these a lot of the medals um, and a lot of them like the big ones that like Napoleon had was like a big necklace and later you would see those um, on other like Louis the 18th and those guys and it's still up until about three presidents ago the president of France, ever since Napoleon, um, every leader of France has been in charge of the, of course, the Legion of Honor. And every, they used to wear these great big, amazing medals um, when they were, you know, inaugurated when they came into power. But a couple of presidents again, got rid of that. But now they just wear it as like a, a little pin. But I think like the, the whole, wear the whole necklace, do it. <laughs> They're really amazing. Like the first time I went in this place, I was just like, I want that one. And I want that one. And I mean, they're all like more like enamel and, you know, they're not like all, um, all like filled with diamonds and stuff, which would make them even better. But you will, when we walk around the side of it, there's some pictures on the side of the museum you could see. So this little place right here, if you follow me on Instagram and my stories, anytime I go into the Orsay, I go early enough that I go could go right there to Les Deux Musées. And I don't know where they get their pan au chocolats, but it is literally, they have the best pan au chocolat I've ever had. I, there's a bakery at the end of the street over here. So that's probably, usually these places get it from the closest bakery, but it is always buttery. And it is always like the chocolate's always like melting inside. And it's the most delicious thing ever. And the guy, the two guys that are always there in the morning, as soon as they see me, they just bring it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. And then there's a little pharmacy up there on the right that we don't have to walk that far, Kate, but there's a little pharmacy over there. And 
they, the gentlemen in there are so nice. And if you are going to Paris in the near future and you need to get your CDC card turned into the pass sanitaire, which is now the vaccination pass, um, they were literally the nice, two nicest gentlemen. I stood in there for like a half an hour talking to him while he did my card, which took longer because we were chatting. Uh, but they were so incredibly nice. And if you need to do that, it's 36 euros, but you're also just fine taking your CDC card with you and just showing it um, everywhere you go. He said to me, he goes, yeah, but the Orsay won't do that. But I've been with clients. I've taken people on tours in the Orsay and they were fine with their CDC card. So it, it literally depends on who you talk to, but pretty much if you have a CDC card, you're still fine, but it is easier and faster to have the QR code. So if you're going to be there for any length of time, and go do it but it's just right down the street and the guys were absolutely wonderful you don't always find that with every pharmacy <laughs> but he was at any of the cutest little puppy and he was just the he was just the nicest gentleman so here you can see like those ones have some diamonds on it but here you can see some of the different metals and there's a whole there's the salt um esprit is a famous one that a lot of, it's highly bestowed um there's quite a few different ones and i will go back in there um when i'm there again in a few weeks and i will do a whole bunch of stuff from in there and it's free to go you could go in there for free which makes it even better um but it's really really a cool museum um it is open wednesdays through sunday from 1 p.m to 6 p.m so it does make it a little bit um it, it just makes it you just have to keep that in mind but um maybe do it where you go to the orsay and then go over to do do musee and have lunch and then go check this out because it's really um it's a really, really cool museum. I was, there was one day recently that I was going to go in there, but I knew that all of the Napoleon ones would not be back yet because the huge Napoleon necklace and everything was at that huge exhibit they did at um, La Villette. And so I was like, oh, it's, that stuff's not going to be back. I'll just wait um, so that it's all there. Um, Judy, getting a test in Paris is insanely easy. I walked in there the same morning. I did the test and I did my change of my health pass because I was leaving the next day and uh, it was super easy. The line, you just have to, my big recommendation is, is if you have to get a test before you head back to the US, go first thing in the morning. If you wait a little bit, that's when the lines get bad. And hopefully by the time, if a lot of people are going within the next few months or even the summer, you know, even the WHO is actually recommending that they get rid of the COVID testing before people are flying, which, cause they say it doesn't really work. So who knows? And it constantly changes. I keep an eye on all of those things. So follow me on Instagram. I'll put those things in my stories. Um, but it's super, super easy in Paris. And it's like 26 euros um, for the antigen test. And that's what it should be everywhere. So if they try to charge you different, it, they are incorrect. <laughs> so we have these fantastic, um, different sculptures that are out here. We're on in front of the Musée d'Orsay now, and they are all from the Universal Exhibition that was over at the Trocadero. And so that was um, in 1898 and, or 1878, sorry. And they were all placed around the Trocadero. And if you've seen those historic um, pictures of what the palace of the Trocadero looked like at that time, it's one of those things that, God, I wish they still had that because it was pretty, at a pretty amazing building, um, but it was surrounded by a bunch of different statues and down around the basin. The water basin that we see now at the Trocadero was part of the exhibition at that period. So all of these statues were down around there and there's um, nine statues out here that we'll see. So first, of course, we have that very adorable elephant over here. And then we have a very cute, uh, there's a rhinoceros, as he might be, uh, there he is. Recently, he was like stuck behind, like inside a box <laughs> back in the fall. Um, but there's the rhinoceros too, and a horse. 
Um, the rhinoceros and the elephant, uh, or the the elephant was done by Fremier, who did our famous um, Joan of Arc statue that ever the golden beauty that she is. The rhinoceros was done um, by Henri Alfred Jacquemart, not the same as the Jacquemart Andre Museum. That's not the same Jacquemart, uh, but this is he's life size and he's just amazing. I mean, look at um, Kate if you could get kind of close enough to see like his skin. It's pretty, um, it's pretty amazing. Obviously we don't rub it for good luck or it'd be all like glowing bronzy. <laughs> but he is really, I think he's just, I think he's so cute. He just is, and he's life-size. Um, and he, they stayed at the Trocadero until 1935. So they were there for quite a long time. Then they moved out to saint Claude. And then in 1985, when they were getting ready to open up the Musée d'Orsay, um, they all got to move back over here. There's a really cool um, painting and I'm gonna put a bunch of the info and a link to the video um, on my website. I created a little tab on my website that's just like the after notes of this so that you have them. Um, and I will put a, I found a really cool painting um, by Ernest uh, Jules Renault and it shows the rhinoceros um, at the Trocadero. It's really cute. And then we have this amazing, I think the horse is even cooler. I always just feel kind of bad for him because he there's that scary thing underneath him, that scary spiky grate. Uh, but he is pretty astounding too. He's done by Pierre-Louis Roulard and it was also done for the exhibition, of course. And it is just, he looks rather angry and, and upset, but he's just so, I think he's just amazing. And these are so there's definitely the sculptures like Barry and Can. They're these sculptures that were basically known for their amazing animals that they would do. Some of them would work almost exclusively in doing sculptures of animals. Um, and uh, they're just amazing when you really look at some of these. Because some of them, like Barry, and would actually go to the Jardin des Plantes with um, Mon Amour, Eugène Delacroix, and uh, they would go there and sit there and sketch and study animals um, and making a ton of notes um, for what they needed to do. And that's why some of these just look so, so um, lifelike and just amazing. So they don't have any of the stanchions. I guess it's, well, it closes here pretty quick. It closes an hour. But the Musée d'Orsay is not requiring you to have a time ticket um, in advance um, as of the end of September, but you still roll the dice. If it is busy, like the week of Christmas, between Christmas and New Year's, it was insane in Paris with so many people. Um, and you definitely needed to have it or they were actually even sold out. So just if you're going in the spring, just keep an eye out on it, um, you know, a good maybe a few weeks before you go. Um, but the, having a ticket in advance does make it a little quicker. Um, the whole skip the line thing at museums is kind of a sham. It's a real scam, especially if they want to charge you more for that because nobody skips the line. Um, it just depends on which line you have, but the line is technically security. So nobody skips that. So if you have a time ticket, sometimes your line is just shorter. So, um, a lot of times, like I've had people like search like ticket to Louvre, and then I've taken them to the Louvre and they show me the thing. And I'm like, where did you order that? You, you know, and it's they charge like an extra 10 euros. And I was like, no, you just go make sure you always go straight to the museum website, to the Louvre, to the Musée d'Orsay, right to their website. Um, otherwise, sometimes you got to be careful because somebody will scam you. So these beautiful statues over here, there's the six statues of the continents. This was also for the Universal Exhibition. Um, and they are pretty, I love this one. Each one of them has, um, each one of them, if you kind of look, you might be able to figure out which one it is. This one was by Moreau and this is Oceana. And you have a kangaroo, that cute little adorable kangaroo there. But always, you know, when we represent, continents and things we're, we're topless so <laughs> it is just what happens I guess this one is South America and on that shield she's holding um it has a bunch of the different countries so it's like Chile and Brazil and a bunch of other stuff but each one of these has like different little attributes so like you've got all of that fruit that you would find in South America 
Um, they're really, each one of them is done by a different sculpture. This one is done by Amy Millet. He also did those gorgeous golden statues we all love so much on the top of the Palais Garnier. And then there's that bird back there. I don't know if that's it, what kind of bird that is. He looks like maybe he's a buzzard or something like that. Um, but these are pretty, I love these statues. And then right next to that one, can you, Kate, if you kind of show what's on that or I bet everybody could guess who, who this is supposed to be. North America. <laughs> so of course, because right there on her paddle on her oar, it says um, Washington, Lafayette, Franklin and Jefferson. And she's represented more as a Native American. And then this one is Africa. And she has her foot on a little turtle down there. And of course, all of that great produce and fruits there. Sometimes the feet on these sculptures freak me out a little bit. <laughs> Sometimes they're just like so gigantic. I love this one. This one is Asia. And I just love, I, I don't, I think this one's like, I like this one the most, I think, but she, cause she's got those cute little elephants on the back. And I just think she's just, she looks, she's just adorable. She's got that little figure sitting on her lap. And this one was done by, uh, oh no, this one was done by Alexander Falguier. The other one was Eugène um, de la Peniche. But I love, I think I just, cause I love that little elephant. I could do like a little tri a trivia thing. Where would you find three, what ele what, uh, what terrace of what museum would you find three elephants? <laughs> and a turtle and a rhinoceros. And then this guy up here, she is of course Europe. And on the right side there, she's got a palette, a paint palette, of course, because it's Europe. And then she has Mercury's Cadesis there, kind of hiding behind it, the symbol of the messenger and commerce. And then on the other side, she's kind of holding what looks like an olive branch, kind of a scepter olive branch. And then that shield there has a horse. So it goes, and it's kind of like the horse over on the other side. So it all, it all comes full circle. But they're really cool. I love going out there and seeing them. Um, so it's sometimes, you know, if you even if you don't have time to go in the Orsay, you could still see some art that's outside, outside of it. And this side of the Orsay, if you listen to the episode, I'll put a link to it um, on the website or go to La Vie Creative, Paris History of Becca Hemingway. Um, we did the one for the Orsay, I think, back in like beginning of December. Um, and this side where we are, this was all part of the hotel. So when they built the original um, train station, it also had a 350 room hotel. So this whole side, when you look up the building, this is the side that the hotel was on, which was kind of amazing. Of course, um, you know, the first building, the Palais d'Orsay was destroyed um, by the commune in 1871, which also destroyed quite a few of the buildings around here. The, um, the Hotel de Sam, which is where the Legion of Honor is that we just went by, it is also um, badly, uh, badly marred by the commune, but luckily did not, uh, it wasn't fully destroyed. But a lot of these buildings um, around here, so, but a lot of the buildings here are pretty much 18th century. So when they were building the train station of the Orsay, they kept it, they did it, uh, even though it was more, <clears throat> it was later on and it was like 1870, they did it so it was a much older style and so that it, uh, it, it, it would match the neighborhood. And that building that's straight across from you, Kate, with that fantastic door, which is really cool. This was the um, former, uh, the Hotel de Panarou. And he was a gentleman that had was basically a lifelong politician. 
he there was actually a couple different hotel particulars back there that he kind of had joined together. He it stayed in his family until 1937. Um, he died in 1937. And then a few years later, the family sold it to the state to which would become the case de depot. Um, and so this whole area where we're going to walk by is all part of uh, of that governmental building but the building's really cool i love i love the end one here on the corner because i just think that would be i would just can i have that upper room as just my op, my office and my library <laughs> be like i just need to just jet right over real quickly to the or say and, and look for something because their website changed and their website's horrible now and i can't find anything so it's easier just to go to the or say <laughs> but Look at, I just love, I love those railings. I just want to be right there, except for I don't think I'd want to look at that more modern building. I would want to look out towards the Orsay. I mean, not that I'm going to be picky or all anything. <laughs> and then we have some other really amazing, ginormous sculptures that were also from the Universe Exhibition. So you just keep walking around. A lot of times you'll find the staff of the Orsay sitting up here on their breaks or smoking, hiding over here. But it's a really like, so you could tell when you look at it from this side, the first time I, I heard um, that it used to be a hotel, I was just like, well, where? And then, but when you're on this side, you could really tell. Um, and it was the very fancy hotel for the time because every room had its own bathroom. And you know, that wasn't a thing. And as you know, that's still sometimes not the thing. <laughs> but see, look at that side. That side of the building is pretty amazing. But it's all now part of the government offices. And they do all sorts of stuff. They look after um, the funds of the state. They look after life and health insurance. They like It's basically business formation. Basically, if it's something to do with money at, at all, they look over it. But also on this street, it's not here anymore, sadly, but there used to be the studio of Jacques-Louis David. And this is where he had a studio when he was painting the Sacre de Napoleon, the giant, amazing painting of the uh, coronation of Napoleon. And it was here that Napoleon came down to visit it to see. And that's where he was like, nope, I want, you know, the Pope needs to look like he's doing something paint him doing something so he had him raise his hand had the pope raise his hand uh, but it was it was done he had a studio here sadly it's there's nothing remaining remaining of it and this is rue de lille is the street and it goes kind of it goes a a little bit farther down And this side, like there's these very modern buildings and there's always construction of some sort over here. There's on the right hand side recently, they had these, uh, you know, heavy metal plates over giant holes in the sidewalk and somebody had moved one and the hole was wide open. And I was like, that's gonna, that cannot be good. <laughs> But the building to the left, this is also, um, originally this used to be part of the barracks, the horse barracks. Um, and then it was also um, badly damaged during the commune. And so then it was rebuilt, but they have, and I was actually trying to find out who did these really great flowers that are on both sides of this side and the side of the Seine with these lilies. I could not find any information, but I'll keep looking. I need to go in there because I found out that the other building, the, the building that we saw just down the street, it is open on my favorite weekend of September. And so I'm definitely gonna go in there. And it, I've tried to go into the closed off part that is the Légion d'Honneur um, in the last couple of years because of Gilets Jaunes, um, they didn't allow people. Then we had COVID and then last year um, it wasn't an option. So I'm really hoping that opens up too. But this building, you could see, I mean, those, I love those, um, those gold lilies on there, which is probably a little take on, you know, the fleur de lis, which is also a lily. But stargazer lilies are my favorite. So I'm just going to imagine they're stargazer lilies. Keep an eye, Kate, because this is where the hole usually is. But maybe they fixed it in the last week. <laughs> it's probably like that. It's like there, yeah, that was like wide open. Like there wasn't even a like a barrier around it. I was like, 
uh, and those plates are really, really heavy. So the rest you know it's going to be there for like a month. Yeah, be careful. <laughs> so there's a restaurant Kate just walked past um, right behind her that was called Le Climat. And it was the former Telegraph building. Um, it is a very expensive restaurant. Um, but it was built, if we could kind of pan up to see the building a little, Kate. I hardly ever look at this because I'm always like, I think, walking underneath it. But it was built in 1905. And so over time, you know, there was construction and things added and a lot of the Art Deco elements of it had been covered. So when the people that opened this spendy restaurant took it over, they ended up um, uncovering a lot of those. And inside, it's absolutely beautiful. It is rather expensive. I think that you could do like a six course lunch or something, and it's like 200 euros. Um, but, you know, sometimes if you partner it with seeing this amazing inside structure, it's you know, do it as one special thing that you're going to do one special meal, do it for lunch rather than dinner, because lunch is always less expensive. Uh, but that used to be where they also had the, um, it was called the uh, Demoiselle de la Poste. And that's actually where like the telephone operators were. So you remember when you see those old uh, movies when they're plugging in the little things connecting people's phone calls, which is so funny. Um, that's what they used to do in there. My grandma, who's 99, sometimes thinks her phone phone line is still a party line and she has to get off the phone for others. I was like, I don't think they've had party lines in my my lifetime, <laughs> but it's adorable. This is a really great restaurant. If you're going to the Orsay, there's a few restaurants around here that's really good. This is a really good one. They're always busy. Um, uh, Les Antiques, I think is what it is. Les Antiques, um, basically the antiques. It is very good. They have all of the, you know, it was a, I think that was one of the first places I had French onion soup in the fall because it was a, a day that finally warranted, it was cold enough for French onion soup and it was very delicious. So that is a really good place if you're going to the Orsay to jump over to go get something to eat. And this street here, this is Rue de Bac. And it leads to, oh, my Louvre. There's another restaurant over here on the side um, that has amazing chicken. And it's called one of my favorite words in all the French, the French language, Coco Rico. And I love that because that's this we say cockadoodle do is the sound a chicken makes or a hen or whatever rooster. This is what the French think the rooster says is Coco Rico. And I just love it. There's really not a lot of opportunities to work that word into general conversation, but it's just fun. And there, that's really good. They have amazing chicken, of course. And it's a very beautiful street. Rudabach goes down quite a ways as well. And then up here on the corner of Rudabach, um, at number one, the building doesn't isn't there anymore, but there's also a, this restaurant here, I don't know if I would put it in my top list of like the greatest restaurants, but it has the greatest view. And another one, if I'm, or say, and maybe I need a Apero, I need a glass of wine. I always come over here, La Forget, which is, has a, you just sit outside and I get to look at the Louvre. So especially as the sun is going down, if you time it around sunset or right after sunset, it's a really great place to sit. It's gotten more touristy um, and, you, and it's one of those menus that has everything under the sun. As you can see, pizzas, crepes, it has everything. Um, I think the food used to be better, but it's also, it's worth it for the view. And they're always very nice there. But right behind you, Kate, on the corner of the building, we could kind of go down this street a tiny bit, but I always love this corner right here with that bar relief here and the and if you look up like the railings. I just love that corner. It's so beautiful. Like look at all those details. Oh, so pretty. And this now is like, I mean, that whole back street and this building going down towards the Orsay. We could walk if we could just walk to that first courtyard and see if we could peek in there. Um, because there is a sculpture in there that's kind of cool. But this was created um, 
after Napoleon. So it was basically under Louis the 18th because Napoleon, you know, he had come back into power for a hundred days and then he got ousted again. He, um, you know, but in his, in his term, he had created the Banque de France. And so Louis the 18th and his people were kind of suspicious of dealing with the, the Bank of France because they thought this is under, you know, this was under his control. We don't know if we want to, you know, have the have them running the money of the country so this is why they kind of created this organization and so it's more under louis the 18th but see you still have those wonderful lilies on this side and then it was created in april on april 28th so you have that on the door april 28th 1816 two days after my birthday but you could kind of see that uh sculpture through there it's by jean uh, du buffet and it's like really colorful it has lots of red and stuff on it but they'll let you poke your head inside there and look at it they don't get mad at you but it's really cool so this one i would love to be able to get inside here and see what's inside So we could, um, well, I was gonna take across the street if you're not gonna get killed. Oh, <laughs> or we could just walk back up there to the corner, whichever. If you so see can, a break, can I cross here? I think so. But the Orsay was also, um, you know, because it was a, it was the um, Palais d'Orsay, and then that got burned down, and then it took, sat there for a very long time. And then when they turned it into the Gare d'Orsay, it actually didn't, it only ran for about 30 years as a train station because the trains got longer and they didn't fit into the train station. So um, then it went through a bunch of different lives before it ended up becoming the museum. But in after the war, it was basically the train station that they were bringing the lucky people to survive the horrific camps were able that came through there. So there's a plaque on the other side of the building um, down on this uh, this side of it that uh, recalls that. But look at that, so pretty. And all the lovely French flags. Now it's getting windy. I hope you're kind of warm, Kate. That's <laughs> fine. Got my big puffy coat on. You need to go to Uniqlo and get some of those heat tech pieces. I do. I really do. Those are like the most amazing thing. And I had one of the long sleeve tops on underneath a sweater and underneath my wool coat in the Orsay. And it they have like different, they have ones that are very thin, but they will keep you very warm. And then I had the, this, one that was a little thicker because it was called the extra warm and I had to go down to the bathroom and like peel off everything to get it off because I thought I was gonna die <laughs> I was like oh my god I'm I burning up yeah. but <laughs> they are like literally the greatest things ever they're not that expensive they're all around like 19 euros or so and you could get like tank tops and long sleeve and scoop necks and leggings and like very thin leggings to put on under your pants if it's really cold and i brought i had all of those with me and i was never cold it was amazing yes it's worth doing then you can wear relatively normal clothes as well yeah but they have like <laughs> socks and they have like all sorts of stuff so check it out if you're someplace that's cold you got it. And even sometimes if I'm cold in the house, I'll put like the turtleneck one on and I stay nice and warm. So of course the sand does looks like it's been going down because it hasn't had any rain, I think for like 10 days or so. So um, the sand was starting to get pretty high right as I was leaving. So it looks a little bit better. But we are on the Pont Royal. And the Pont Royal got that name because it led to the Palais des Tuileries, which is the palace that was created by uh, Catherine de Medici, which was destroyed in the commune, of course, and also stood for a very, very long time before it was actually removed. But 
everybody says that there's nothing that remains of it, but technically what we see at the very end of the Louvre as the pavillon de flore is in the other side that is the Marsan. This was actually the Tuileries. So the Louvre here is on this side of it. The Danone wing is the Grand Gallery. They had created that to connect to the Tuileries. So technically, this pavillon was the Tuileries. It has completely been rebuilt since then, though. So, <laughs> but the other side, the Marsan, is most of that, a lot of that is original. This, a lot of it had changed. And if you look really far up there at the very top um, is the floor um, by Carpo. And she is standing, she's sitting over there. She's kind of leaning over and she's surrounded by some little um, genies, some little angels. And um, there's all of this beautiful, you know, foliage and flowers and stuff. But the, it's hard to see from here, of course, it's even hard when you're there. But if when you go into the Orsay, the plaster model of it is there. So you could get up close and see that plus the part that's right below it um, as well. And so there's a whole thing at the end of the um, lower level of the Orsay where the statuary is. There's um, Carpo's uh, dance, the original one that was on the outside of the Palais Garnier that you know everybody freaked out about because it had people that looked happy and naked and um, somebody threw ink on it and tried to destroy it. Eventually it was taken down and put into the Orsay and the copy that is outside of the, or, or the um, outside of the opera now, the Palais Garnier was done by Paul Belmondo who was the sculptor of, and father of the actor, Jean-Paul Belmondo, who recently died. It all comes together, doesn't it? <laughs> but you see the beautiful Orsay over there and the Pont Royal, the original Pont Royal was built in 1685 by Jules Hardin Mansart. And he, of course, we all love him because of the roof lines of Paris. Um, but it was the first bridge um, was built in 1632 and it was made of wood. So of course that didn't last very long. It was originally called the Bridge of St. Anne for Anne of Austria, the mother of Louis XIV. And then the second version um, was built with wood, but it was built um, with red wood. And so it was called the Red Bridge, which you know, I was like, what? Bring them back. I need a red bridge. <laughs> everything red but that one sadly um, was wood as well and it got ran into too many times and then when they had a huge ice storm in february 1684 the whole thing just basically collapsed and and washed away so this one was created in 1685 so it's one of the older bridges and of course during the revolution they changed the name because it couldn't be called royal so it's gone through quite a few different names as it, everything else does. Um, then now it's back to the Pont Royal. We could actually, Kate, why don't we go across and let's go down the road side of, this, of the Louvre. Sorry. <laughs> because I don't think we've ever walked down there and we could show the amazing lions on the side. And maybe if it's open, we could walk through that part. Sometimes when you're walking, if you've been walking all day and then you need to get around and sometimes it's just not easy. Like the intersections are just different than you have in the States. You know, everything is very, you know, square or straight. And sometimes if you need to cross the street, you have to go like all the way down, like halfway down the street just to get over. And when you've been walking all day and your arms are full of too many books that you bought, which is my problem, it's like, oh God. Can I just cross here? <laughs> I can't walk 10 more steps. That's always my problem. Because see, instead of just taking left right here, we have to walk across and then we'll go over. But we'll make it, we'll make it. But thank you everybody for being here today. We really appreciate it. And if I have any new people from a, uh, the live I did with Rue Dauphine yesterday. Welcome, welcome. And we want to thank you. And we are happy to bring all these, but we also are happy to accept any tips. So if you want to um, 
leave us a little something, you could send it via my PayPal or Venmo, which is at Claudine at ClaudineHemingway.com. And we could put it in the comments too. To help fund our little project we have here. It's so good to see you, Karen. So we're gonna walk down here to these lovely, I just love these lions. I just, lions I've ever, I, I think ever since I was a kid, when I think, uh, does everybody remember, wasn't it like Anne Klein, the designer always put lions on things? And then I think ever since then, I just thought they were just so cute. Like, I just want to have one to like cuddle up with, which would probably be a very bad idea. <laughs> I don't think, uh, I don't think they're very, I don't think they would be into cuddles, but they're just so cute. But there's these amazing ones here. And this is like, if you have a morning, like, especially a Sunday morning and you get up early enough, um, just come over here and walk around the whole outside of the Louvre, um, especially if it's like sunny and the sun is hitting this. I took a picture one time of the sun in the morning hitting this and kind of shining all the gold. And it was like, the building was like orangey red. Oh, it's just the most beautiful thing ever. And they have these amazing uh, lions up here. And when they were created, I'm just like the lions on the other side, <clears throat> they made it from the mirrored version of it. And those are bought by Bari, who also did all those, but they're just so, they're just so regal and majestic looking. But this map there, Kate, if you go to that map, so I just noticed this back in the fall one day when I was walking by here, I was like, this is actually pretty amazing. I never stopped and looked at it because I already know where everything is, but it actually has like all of the streets around it. So I thought that was actually super cool. Like all the little streets that are on the other side and then it has all the names of the bridges. So it's not just a map of the Tuileries and the Louvre. The Tuileries is overseen by the Louvre. They manage and take care of it. And that's why it always looks so wonderful. Um, but I thought this map was actually really cool. So if you're walking somewhere someday and you don't have GPS on your phone and you're lost and you're wondering where is the Rue de Louvre, come to the map. There's actually a few of these around the building. But then you've got the little wavy lines. It's the Sen. Genius. Yeah, so cute how they've done that. I know. Yeah, the river. It's lovely. And then we'll walk through this way. You have another gorgeous. This is a lot of this was um, redone under Napoleon III. He um, had basically raised up when you go down a little farther um, where the cars drive through. That wasn't originally a pass through. You couldn't, you, that whole area you couldn't drive through. They actually had basically this redone and lifted up. And so the whole grand gallery shifted a bit, but you see in the ceiling, there's a big end there. That's Napoleon the third. So he did a lot of this. So this is the Porte de, de Lyon. And this used to be a kind of a secret entrance that you could go through. They got Napoleon there again. Um, that if you already had your ticket, you could um, go in here. Well, they don't let you now. Um, and then it used to just be for large groups. Um, I tried to go in there one day because I just wanted to see if you could actually get closer to, you know, get to the Mona Lisa quicker. And uh, they, even as a member, they were like, nope, you can't come in. <clears throat> but this is the Porte de Lyon with these beautiful lions on this side. And then if we go down, Kate towards the next one towards the end. Then we could go see the entrance dedicated to somebody that should have a whole lot more than a door dedicated to him. <laughs> but I guess we can't be picky. But this is also where the Ecole de Louvre is, um, which is they have a whole thing right now online. I think it, I saw it in the, I think I saw it on Facebook and then it has all these videos. So you could kind of see behind the scenes of the school. And it gave you like a walkthrough of all their different like uh, auditoriums. I was like, oh, they're not all fancy and old looking though. 
but they still are pretty cool. So this is the uh, Porte jo uh, Jojar, which is named for Jacques Jojar, who was the in charge of the museum during World War II. He was in charge of the National Museums. He is the one that orchestrated and moved everything out of the Louvre, saving all of it so nothing was stolen by the greedy hands of the Nazis. And all he gets is a plaque on a door. He really should have an entire wing let name to him or part of the entire wing because without him the louvre could have lost a lot of things but he and rose Vallon, they need they need a lot more so that the far um, pavillon there is the marsan so that was also so basically where kind of where kate is if you did a line between these two pavillons that this whole thing was the palais des trilleries that stretched all the way down there and this, of course, is the Tuileries, uh, the Jardin, which they've been doing a bunch of work on. They finished the work on this side, and now they're doing the other side. Um, they're supposed to, it says that they're supposed to be making things a lot easier, but it was just kind of an open place to walk anyway. So I'm not really sure what else they're doing, but we shall see in time. But this area right where Kate is, is usually where there's dogs running around. And you can sit on and walk on the grass in this in this gar in this park, unlike a lot of the parks. But you can sit in here. They did have in the fall on the side of where Kate just was. They had a bunch of scaffolding, and um, it didn't. It was open, and so it was a Sunday morning. And so I walked up the scaffold, like walked up the stairs, and like looked. And then I was terrified that you know they they some scary guys would come. They'd see me on camera, so I was scared to death. <laughs> But I was, I felt like I was, you know, loitering around where I wasn't supposed to. It was quite exciting for those three seconds. So, and then you look back, of course, to the beautiful Louvre, which if you guys saw the walk um, I did at the beginning, I think it was like on January 2nd, we walked around here and I took you and showed you a bunch of the buildings that are all lit up in blue um because france had taken over being in charge of the european union for six months beginning on january 1st so they lit up like tons of the buildings in paris in blue um the louvre and the institut de france and notre dame and soccer cur i mean that like i dozens of them um and it was really fun to see the Eiffel Tower is still blue. Um, it only lasted a week for the other buildings, but the Eiffel Tower is blue until the end of the month. So pictures, I'm sure you've seen pictures of that online. It's pretty, um, it's pretty fun to see. And then of course the wonderful. So this part right here um, used to, this is basically where the Tuileries used to be. So it was right next to here. But when my grandparents first went here, he has pictures from 1972. And this was before a lot of this was redone. Um, and so this, the layout of the statuary and stuff was a little bit different. And a lot of the original statues that were here are now in the Louvre. And most of them are over in the core uh, Puget of the Richelieu wing. So you could go see a lot of the originals there. And then copies were put in place here because when you when you can really it is really interesting to look at these statues read what the plaque says because it'll tell you where they used to be it's interesting to see just how being out in the elements you know really takes a toll on these marble statue statues there was one i saw that had been down in Brittany by the sea and that one really had a lot of damage because of the salt salt water and salt air um but it's good they brought those things in because they, pro I don't know, you really see where it wears away, especially on the small details um, where they really get really rounded and kind of um, a lot of the edges disappear. And some of the stuff gets covered up, but the, the Tuileries itself, because it is run by the Louvre, um, the gardeners um, do this really cool thing every spring where they design the beds of the Louvre, of the Tuileries to match something in the Louvre. So whether it's a special exhibition coming, um, it'll like when they did the Delacroix exhibit a few years ago, they, the beds were different um, 
paintings. And so there was one that was like, basically the colors were all inspired by uh, Liberty leading the people. Um, it was just really, really cool. The anniversary of I Am Pay, they did something. So it was all this stuff reminiscent of the colors um, and different parts of the pyramid. Um, it was really, really cool. So every year I can't wait to see what they're going to do. There's an exhibit coming up that'll be about um, the pharaohs. So a lot of Egyptian. So we'll see if that is going to be something that they're going to do, which will be really cool. And if you're going to Paris in the spring, of course, I do tours when I am there. And in a, in a bit, I will be there full time. But I will be there in the spring. So if you want some tours of Paris and even the Louvre, my favorite place, um, I could get, I know all the secrets of how to move quickly in and out of there. They're not really, they're all hidden in plain sight, but it's, uh, I, could, I know how to get through quickly. But I can't wait to see. But they, I'm currently working on the list of all of the upcoming exhibits for the year. So if you are going to be there, I will eventually get all the, that up on my website too. It's very difficult to find all that information in one place. And um, I always have a long list of things I'm going to see. So I do it for my own sake <laughs> of trying to make a list of everything I want to see. But um, because it is very difficult to find all that in one place, it's almost impossible. Um, I'll put it together and put it on my website so you guys could all find it. So we can walk up to the Arc de Triomphe de Carousel and then we'll end there. Oh, there's the chestnut guy. I, I can't stand that smell. <laughs> Does it smell like it's burning, Kate? It really does. It's, oh. not, it's not a great smell. No, and there's people that are always like, oh, I love to smell the 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 roasting chestnuts. I was like, no, it smells like burning dog hair. <laughs> yeah, it does. I, I've never had one. I, I can't really imagine what they taste like, but the smell doesn't make me want to try. <laughs> no, I just I'm like, I always have to walk by and I'm like, oh my gosh, and like cover my nose. It smells like when you get your hair caught in the hairdryer. Yes, exactly. It does not smell wonderful. I don't know why people think it's a great smell. <laughs> Maybe these guys are doing it differently in Paris. Maybe it's like in Portugal. Maybe yeah. like in Portugal it's done differently. So the wonderful, this one, um, the two major arcs here that's in line were both created by Napoleon, but this is the only one he saw finished. The Arc de Triomphe, he never saw finished. Um, they created a, a wood copy of it so that when he was brought his second wife into Paris, they would travel underneath the Arc de Triomphe, um, the wood, the basically wood size model. And uh, so he never saw that one finished, but this one, this one's gonna go under some restoration soon because it is needs a little bit of uh, TLC, but it's really gorgeous because you have those pink, uh, the pink marble pillars. There's like six different colors of marble that's used on it. It's pretty amazing. Oh, and there's my beloved. I miss her every day. <laughs> but it's still quiet. It's nice and quiet. So they, uh, things are easing some restrictions in Paris in the next couple of weeks by February 16th. You still have to wear a mask inside. Um, but some of the other restrictions like the discotheques, good news, those are reopening if you're the discotheque person and you're heading to Paris soon. I think most people are kind of going in the spring, but it is still pretty quiet. So I had a lot of, I have a lot of people say, well, you know, everything, everything was going on there. I was like, yeah, but it's not very busy. So it's very easy to stay away from people. And I always, I pretty much always sit outside unless I'm in Levant Comtois. And if I'm in Comtois, I stand by the door. <laughs> and so I, uh, I felt perfectly safe there. I felt safer there. There's a lot of the, the health pass and stuff. It's uh, it gives you a lot more peace of mind than being in the U.S. And you know, when you're flying over there, you know that everybody has to have a negative test. Um, and the connecting flights in the U.S., you're just 
you don't know, including the guy on the way back from New York that got sick all over himself. That was a pleasant experience and a wonderful welcome to the U.S. <laughs> so, but oh, look, the pyramid's starting to get lit. Oh, the building's lighting up. So yeah, it's going to be a well it's sunset. Sadly, we don't get a sunset tonight because of all of the clouds. But I will just, Kate's just indulging me seeing the Louvre now. <laughs> I should take I, I need it to, we need to, you need to come back into the Louvre with me someday. I know, yeah, we'll, we'll be here when you're here next. So yeah. Can... I did go in there for a few minutes with Kate and her lovely mom, Karen, who's watching. Ooh. And the Cafe Marley. Oh. That's not the first time I've seen that group right there. I think I've seen this group of girls doing this right there before. You, it, It's amazing if you just sometimes, sometimes after being in the Louvre all day, I just will go sit on one of those benches that surround the building. And it's amazing if you just sit there for 20 minutes, the things that you will see, the wedding photo shoots, the other photo shoots, the TikTok dances, the, you know, it's the, what is it the influencers in the wild or whatever that instagram page is that is absolutely hilarious it's there there's i'm surprised i haven't seen more things on there from the louvre all the world's a stage the, all the world is a stage especially there especially paris right <laughs> yeah all right well we will leave everybody right here and we will see you next week um probably back to our regular time because as we keep going we're gaining more uh daylight every day thank goodness the slow march away from darkness so we will see you and if you guys um want to leave us a little tip at all you could do that um at paypal or venmo at claudine at claudine um, i put the link there in the chat and we'd appreciate anything to keep this going and we thank everybody for joining us and then check on my website. I'll get the video posted and the notes um, hopefully later on today, um, depending on how long YouTube wants to take on that. And um, so if you have any questions, if you guys have anything you guys want us to show you in Paris, if there's something you really wanna see, um, send me a message on Instagram and obviously you can email me Claudine at ClaudineHemingway.com and let me know if there's something that you want us to show you. I have a long list of places. So I'll, I always have to try to decide which one um, to narrow it down to uh, for each, each walk. Cause every, sometimes I'm just like, Oh, wait, where do we want to go? So um, there's so many, it's, it's endless in Paris as we know. And then um, if there's some of the things you want to see that's inside, um, especially when I get back, especially we, I've done one in the Louvre before. I've done one in the Orsay, but that was just way too crowded with people at the time of the day. So maybe we'll have to do some um, when, when there's a little less people. Um, if it's, the timing's kind of weird first thing in the morning because it's like midnight in, in the West Coast, but uh, we could figure some things out. But let me know if there's something you guys want to see and we could show you. And then maybe Kate will show her beautiful face back on the camera. I'll turn mine back on so we could all say goodbye. Kate's like, mm -hmm. I don't want to see you people. I don't want to see you. <laughs> <laughs> there she is. Well, you thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. It looks like they haven't changed the billboard yet. The one that they had before this was amazing. It was basically like if there was a photo taken behind Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People. So it was like staged like the painting, but then the picture was like the photo was from behind and it was only up for like two days. It was a good yeah. cool scene though. When I left, it was the Beyonce and Jay-Z Tiffany. Yeah. I know they change all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys. Thank you all so much. And we hope to see you next week. And goodbye to Mama Karen there. She's blowing you kisses, Kate. <laughs> thank you guys and have a wonderful week. And then tomorrow's podcast, 
is about the statues from Notre Dame that I also did a webinar little video about. So you could, it's one of those that you could, when you go to Paris, take it with you and you could do a little walking tour all on your own. So we will see you soon. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Claudine. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>